Thank you so much, Leah. Um, and thank you to the Old State House for hosting me again. I sincerely appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to come home. So when I tell people whenever they ask me what do I prefer, Fayetteville or Little Rock, I'm like, I am a 501 girl. So. <laughs> All right, so yes, this presentation today is a microcosm of my broader dissertation. And the subject matter that I'm looking at today is not only Daisy Gatson Bates, but the women who surrounded her, the women who in so many ways came before her participating in activism in Little Rock, and then women who stood alongside her and the teenage girls who would go on to integrate Central High School. Today's story is actually focused about the year before 1957 and a lot of the legal um, issues and... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of the legal issues and social issues that came before the actual crisis itself. So that is the reason for the title that you see today. Actually, can you go? Can I pop out of this for just a minute so I can see? Okay. I'm not sure how to pop out of it. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. It is the best whenever you have technical difficulties in class and your students are looking at you and they really think that they're going to get out of a lecture for today because the smart boys on them and then you shock them because you've got it all up here so there are still notes to take. Yes. <laughs> all right. So without further ado, um, what I like to do whenever I address how middle class black women attacked activism in Little Rock in 1956 is to back up and remind everybody what the essential crux of the entire crisis pivots on in the first place. And that is, of course, Brown versus Board of Education and the desegregation of America's public schools. And in Little Rock, we have to start with the essential figure who led the white resistance in that, who would be Virgil Blossom. And I realize it's a little bit interesting for people to hear me say that he led white resistance. And though he was absolutely the superintendent of the Little Rock School Board, though he said that he would comply with Brown versus Board of Education and its 1955 counterpart, Brown II, that stated that public schools must desegregate with all deliberate speed, what we'll see is that he did drag his feet in some major ways and that he wound up capitulating to white segregationists, which is why in my work I place him in that camp. But we have to understand who he is before we can definitively say, okay, this makes sense to place him in this camp. Virgil T. Blossom was no stranger to integration. He had actually 
been the superintendent and principal of Fayetteville High School whenever that school system integrated in 1954. So he was actually a veteran of desegregation efforts and a veteran of limited public backlash to this process in Northwest Arkansas. He really believed that he would not have any significant trouble desegregating Little Rock in 1956 and 1957 because Little Rock was known as one of the most progressive cities in the South, one of the most liberal cities in the South, which of course you have to view those two words, progressive and liberal, through a white lens because absolutely that was not the way that the city was experienced by any African Americans living within Little Rock, no matter what their class status. And in fact, Elsie and Daisy Bates, who ran the Arkansas State Press, the state's largest black owned newspaper, frequently argued against this characterization of Little Rock as this progressive bastion. For white people, however, they really believed that because Little Rock had not experienced the issues of Birmingham or Montgomery or Charleston, South Carolina or Baton Rouge, Louisiana, that it was a cut above and that perhaps integration could go off without a hitch in Little Rock. Virgil Blossom's initial plan which he hammered out with the assistance of white PTAs, black PTAs, and influence from the NAACP, of which Daisy Bates was president for the Arkansas chapter, was a plan initially to integrate elementary schools at the kindergarten level in 1956, and then to annually stay integrated through the 13-year process of K through 12 education, so that by the 1960s and 70s, all classes would be integrated and integration would essentially be seamless. Children would have grown up with it and White Little Rock would not experience the shocks of integration that some people feared it might. What we find though is that Virgil T. Blossom had a very poor understanding of what kind of city Little Rock was versus what kind of city, what kind of town Fayetteville was in 1954. Fayetteville was not a city. Fayetteville did not have a large black population of any size, and that was part of the reason that integration had gone off without a hitch in Fayetteville and without much public fanfare. He grossly underestimated what kind of social con conditions existed in Little Rock, and it turns out he was not very willing to, to challenge those in any effective way. <clears throat> The Little Rock School Board ultimately rejected the plan that he had concocted with white and black PTAs and with the assistance of the NAACP. And the white lash, what I refer to as the white lash in my work, ultimately caused him to capitulate to forces such as the Arkansas Association of Citizens Councils, led by Amos Guthridge, who some of you may be familiar with, was one of the most virulent opponents of integration in Little Rock. He actually argued to the Little Rock School Board that, quote, they would have to decide if they were for the white folks or for the NAACP. Justice Jim Johnson also infamously argued that, quote, God did not intend for the races to mix or to mongrelize. And Governor Orville Faubus was so terrified of both of these men that despite having had a rather relative progressive record of race relations in his government, he ultimately capitulated to the side of segregationists in order to avoid Justice Jim Johnson challenging him for the governorship of the state. So essentially, he sold out his principles for political capital, and Virgil Blossom sold out to these people as well. He failed to deliver on his promise to integrate in 1956, and that is where our woman, Daisy, really begins to, to make her mark in the drive for equal education in the state of Arkansas. My paper, or excuse me, my dissertation hinges on the word intersectionality. And intersectionality is a fairly new um, historical term. It was coined in 1989 by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a Columbia Law professor. And what she argues is that intersectionality refers specifically to the unique set of challenges that black women have faced as both members of um, blackness, 
as African Americans and also as women, that it's a specific kind of racism and sexism that affects only this group of women and that has to be unpacked through that lens and through that set of experiences, which is why I come back to that word over and over again in my work. Before Daisy Bates had this particular word to reference the experiences that middle class black women shared in Little Rock, she was living them. She had been living them before she became involved in the integration, uh, in the integration issue in the city. She had been working for it essentially all of her life. Whenever I was here in September, I discussed her early life in Huttig, Arkansas and the specific challenges that she faced growing up as a young black girl in Southern Arkansas that translated after her marriage to LC and that she continued to face even after she had entered into the middle class of the capital city. She and her husband LC used their paper, the Arkansas State Press, to specifically talk about issues that affected middle class black women that didn't affect necessarily lower class women, that didn't affect working class women, that didn't affect white women whatsoever, but that specifically spoke to this unique group of women who faced racism, sexism, and classism from all levels of all kinds of society. In her paper, in their paper rather, they always referenced black women as miseries or miss, which was a complete departure from what white newspapers would do, where they would only refer to black women by their first or last names. They consistently carried stories of black middle class excellence, and this was specifically centered on women. So for young girls who had accomplished anything from belonging to the beta club, to joining the band, to singing, to having a particular talent, the newspaper would focus on these young girls. For teenage girls and for young women in their early 20s, if you attended college, if you had any kind of prodigious talent that you could be recognized for, the Arkansas State Press would blow that up. And specifically for young engaged women or newlyweds, they love to showcase young black women from the middle class who were living as wives, mothers, in these positions of respectability that traditionally had been stripped from them by white society. They also repeatedly highlighted abuses of black women to showcase that these were women who were ladies in every sense of that word except for skin color, according to white society. They repeatedly highlighted abuses from law enforcement. They highlighted abuses from white civilians, usually from white employers who might either legally abuse a woman, economically abuse a woman, or sometimes sexually abuse a woman who was in their employee. They carried these stories to showcase how black women were mistreated in overall society in a way that was absent from virtually every other news source within the state. And these were not, the, the Bateses were not the first people to do this. In 1942, Little Rock experienced a shockwave through the court case Morris versus Williams, etc. Um, Sue, Sue Cowan Morris, who had been an African-American educator here in the city, sued um, Little Rock for salary equitization, and she was supported by an army of female black educators within the city, including some relatives of the future Little Rock Nine. So Daisy Bates was not the first person to lead this charge for intersectional appreciation and for African-American equity in the city. She was also not the only person in the region doing this kind of work. In cities as large and as far away as Dallas, Texas, there were committees to abolish discrimination um, against black women, against Negro women, as the official title is, women who were segregated in stores, even from black men, from having shopping rights within public places, women who couldn't receive their food in store fronts, even though black men could, these, com these committees were formed specifically to address the intersectional discrimination <clears throat> that Daisy Bates was concerned with primarily here in Little Rock. Arkansas also had statewide chapters devoted to combating intersectional discrimination for black women. The Arkansas Association of Colored Women's Clubs hosted a major symposium in 1955 specifically to look at these problems. One of their keynote speakers 
Gwendolyn Floyd, who served as the regional coordinator for the National Council for Negro Women, argued that ultimately, quote, it was women's responsibility in an integrated society to complete the understanding of problems faced by the Negro woman. So 30 years before Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw coined the fancy term intersectionality, these women were living that reality and they were talking about it just without that big legal word to define it. Daisy, at this same meeting, went on to say, quote, that segregation was the basis of all of our troubles and that the Negro woman can never make her true contribution to American society until segregation is abolished. So ultimately, you have a history within this city of African American women from the middle class who were in absolutely no mood to tolerate Virgil Blossom's ultimate cowardice on the question of integrating schools immediately. And in January of 1956, Daisy Bates ultimately organizes black middle class Little Rock to combat the problem that she sees specifically in Virgil T. Blossom and the Little Rock School Board. She and the NAACP descended upon Blossom in his offices to make a point about the intransigence ultimately of the white Little Rock School Board. This photo taken by uh, L.C. Bates for the Arkansas State Press is one of the most fabulous pictures I've come across in all of my research of this particular topic. Um, on this day in January of 1956, she took seven girls and the regional director for the Arkansas NAACP, F.W. Smith, who's featured right, <laughs> who's featured right here, into Mr. Blossom's office to showcase specifically that there was no reason for the Little Rock School Board or for Virgil Blossom to discriminate against these particular people in any way. The girls that she took with her to make this point about intersectionality and ultimately integration in a mixed race society were to showcase that Jim Crow actually emphasized feminine fragility and that viewed masculinity as the ultimate danger to women. The NAACP in this moment perfectly used the prim modesty of these middle class black girls who would have been considered ladies absolutely in every way except for skin color, that they were ultimately living in a hypocritical society against a recalcitrant, a recalcitrant white patriarch in Virgil T. Blossom. These girls were ultimately feminine. They were all belonging to either the Baptist or Methodist churches in their communities. They were all stellar students at Dunbar Junior High School and Horace Mann High School. And yet, Virgil Blossom persisted in level in tabling his plan for integration in 1956. Daisy Bates also positioned herself perfectly behind these girls as a mother figure dressed in her absolute Sunday best with her reputation in Little Rock as a respectable middle class black female business owner so that there was absolutely nothing in her character either to use against her except for the fact of rank racism and sexism. The only person in this picture who gives away any of his feeling is actually F.W. Smith, which you might be able, you might not be able to tell in just from resistance, but he has the, the best side eye that he is giving Virgil Blossom. He is just having none of it. But he is the only person who reveals anything except um, ultimate respectability in this photo. This image also serves as a reminder of white authorities' historical disdain for black respectability and the pretending that such a thing did not exist at all, despite the fact that it obviously did alongside the white middle class. Ironically, I argue, it is the middle class black femininity that questioned the entire construct of white womanhood, and that this struck at least as much terror into the hearts of the white community as did the specter of supposedly dangerous black masculinity. None of the seven women in this photograph actually went on to integrate Central High School, but it was their specific challenge to the white power structure of Little Rock that highlights the inequities that enraged white people across the city, and as we'll see in particular, white working class women who were threatened by the idea that black middle class ladies 
were a class of people who existed in their hometown. January 1956 laid the groundwork for the court case that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, titled Aaron versus Cooper. Aaron versus Cooper was brought into the Pulaski County Chancery Court in February of 1956. So essentially, as soon as Virgil Blossom decided to table his initial plan for integration, the NAACP immediately brought suit. The case actually represented 31 children and families who were refused admittance into white schools in 1956. And something that I highlight in my paper, in my work, over and over again, is that 55% of the students represented in Aaron versus Cooper were girls. And this was wholly intentional because, again, girls were seen as less threatening, they were seen as more viable, they were seen as inherently less dangerous as the stereotypes of black masculinity that existed within the white South. <clears throat> Within Aaron versus Cooper, Daisy Bates was subpoenaed to make depositions for the defense. And there's little doubt that middle class black womanhood and the values that defined that structure fundamentally drove the lawsuit and her reactions as a key defendant in that courtroom. The transcripts of the trial also reveal <clears throat> that even as women, Daisy Bates, the mothers and the, the daughters who were part of this court case, even as they were attacked through segregation and injustice, they chose to root their strategy for potentially winning this court case in respectability, in graciousness that underscored their positions as black ladies within their community that had to be recognized by the city at large. In her own deposition, Bates affirmed to the defense attorney for the Little Rock School Board, his name was Leon Catlett, we'll talk about him in just a minute, that the plaintiffs had been very courteously received by the Little Rock School Board and that they had responded friendly and kind. That still did not alter the fact that ultimately Virgil Blossom was refusing the mandated Supreme Court order to integrate schools with all deliberate speed and that they had been rebuked on positions of racism and sexism exclusively. This is Leon Catlett, the defense attorney for the Little Rock School Board. And it is his interactions with Daisy Bates that led to one of the most famous showdowns of the entire crisis that often gets overshadowed in what happened in 1957. But you can see the fomenting of, of the backlash, of the blacklash and the whitelash that I refer to in, in my broader work here in this microcosm of Aaron versus Cooper. Bates, as a chief witness <clears throat> for the NAACP, used her platform effectively as the then most visible figure for the integration effort to challenge white supremacy and also to demand that middle class black ladies be treated with the privileges that white ladies were accordingly treated with. A mere skimming of the trial transcripts for Aaron versus Cooper revealed that this case was excruciatingly long and the examinations for Daisy Bates and for other defendants in Aaron versus Cooper were also excruciatingly long. Leon Catlett in particular chafed several times during Daisy Bates' immutability during this process. And he remarked at one point to Daisy, who was being particularly intransigent on the stand in response to some of the questions that she was being asked, he said to her, quote, Daisy, we have a right to ask you these questions. And as Daisy Bates persisted that anything less than immediate desegregation suited the parents of these children or the NAACP or the Supreme Court, she would refuse to answer questions. Leon Catlett became visibly frustrated, and eventually he argued <clears throat> that black people in Little Rock essentially were intransigent, quote, Negroes, N-I-G-R-A-H, with a hard southern draw. Daisy Bates immediately snapped back and said, Mr. Catlett, the word is pronounced Negro, not Negro. <laughs> that was an immediate showstopper in that courtroom because for a black woman to correct a white man's use of racial slurs in a public forum, particularly as the man in question represented the elite, which Catlett did for the Little Rock School Board, 
Therefore, he was a symbol of untouchable white supremacy. That resounded well beyond the confines of the Pulaski County Chancery Court. Daisy Bates also struck a blow for black ladies' respectability when she stopped Catlett's cross-examination to admonish him for his overfamiliarity with calling her Daisy instead of Mrs. Bates. Jim Crow culture pivoted on the infantilization of black adults and the entire concept of exalted Southern white womanhood existed on that juxtaposition of white purity to black degradation. So when Catlett, <clears throat> he never conceived for a second in his life of referring to Daisy Bates as Mrs. Bates. That was simply not something in Jim Crow culture for a white man to do. Bates refused exclusion for herself or for other women of her standing from that decorum that was afforded to Southern white women when she pointed out that she had never met Catlett before this particular trial. And so she told him, quote, the reserve from, <clears throat> excuse me, I reserve the right of my name to be used by my intimate friends and my husband. You will refrain from calling me Daisies. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Done. <laughs> To which he snapped back, then I won't call you anything, and she said, that will be fine. <laughs> this was an exchange that was recorded by the Arkansas State Press, by the Arkansas Democrat, and by the Arkansas Gazette, and that was talked about in every coffee shop and hair salon in the entire county. Such confidence not only revealed Bates's willful personality and a lifetime of anger at intersectional abuse, it was her insistence of the recognition of respectable black womanhood across class lines that belonged to housekeepers, to housewives, and to professional women alike who were categorized by patronizing endearments such as auntie, which was a traditional reference for domestic workers, to the indignity of first names for housewives and professional women, and a host of gendered racist pejoratives that were designed to keep these women in a specific underling class. Daisy Bates's public shaming of Leon Catlett represented the scores of middle class black women across Little Rock as well, and the entire South, who insisted that the pedestal of womanhood did not belong solely to white women, especially to those white women who only claimed a pedestal status because of skin. So white working class women in Little Rock understood this as a particular attack that Daisy Bates belonged to a class that they did not, and that race was the only characteristic that separated the two of them in that status. Moreover, Catlett's particular humiliation affirmed that black ladies existed and that they were undaunted by white masculinity, the ultimate power symbol in the Jim Crow South. All of the meanings in this brief exchange must have been quite a lot for Mr. Catlett and for the entire defense that the Little Rock School Board was trying to build <clears throat> whenever he determined that he would not reference Bates at all if he could not call her by her first name. Rather than accept that indignity, Daisy went through the rest of the trial not, trial, not being referenced by any title whatsoever. Ultimately, this won her a lot of worship in the South. <laughs> Across the South, newspapers celebrated her action, and they celebrated it not only on behalf of her, but on behalf of black womanhood generally. Mark Johnson of Louisville, Kentucky wrote that, quote, he was made proud by the reported conduct that she displayed in upholding her dignity and demanding that she be respected. Beulah Lee Flowers in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, a, a regular citizen, um, wrote to uh, the, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Pine Bluff Tribune and argued that she was proud of Daisy Bates for her, quote, womanly stand and for being such a good witness. She did a credit to womanhood in general. And President Irene McCoy Gaines of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs lauded Rosa Parks and Daisy Bates whenever she said that these women were protectors, treasures, and symbols of finest womanhood. This attention mirrored the simultaneous media spotlighting of abuse that black women suffered at the hands of white civilians and of law enforcement. Black women of limited means or station included themselves in this celebration 
that was embodied by women like Bates, Gaines, and Parks as they demanded that the private and public alike revere their virtue and their femininity. And black women who claimed the middle class pedestal and protections of ladies and the dignity of respectability did not go unnoticed by any class within the white South. Ultimately, however, Aaron versus Cooper was a lost case. Judge John E. Miller, who ruled the case for the Little Rock School Board, sided ultimately with Virgil Blossom's tabling of the plan, so long as he implemented a new plan to, <clears throat> on um, August 28, 1956. The NAACP ultimately lost Aaron versus Cooper because of a lack of communication between the state office and the national office for that organization. Um, four attorneys actually represented uh, the 31 children in Aaron versus Cooper, and there was very bad communication in between the regional office and the national office, which um, ultimately culminated in the national office saying that the Virgil Blossom plan had been unconstitutional. That wasn't what the Little Rock office had built the case around whatsoever, but the national office held sway. And so ultimately, Miller ruled in favor of the Little Rock school board. <clears throat> However, in the Eighth Circuit Court in Missouri in early 1957, it was ruled that Central High School would serve as the first integrated high school in the city in the fall of 1957. So a new version of the Blossom Plan would be carried out at the high school level. This program, however, was markedly different than the one initially agreed upon in 1956. For starters, it started out at the high school level, meaning that students had already grown up in, completely in segregated classrooms. There would be no easy integration for young minds and for young social bodies the way that there would have been at the kindergarten level, which was the heart of the original Blossom Plan. Also, no black teachers would be allowed to teach white high school students, as white students would not be admitted into Horace Mann High School. The single integrated school in the city would be Central. Transfers would also be allowed at Central High School meaning that white students would have the option of leaving Central High School to attend the newly built Hall High School in the Heights neighborhood or attending the school in Saline County if they did not want to continue going to Central High School after integration. The possibility of 200 black students <clears throat> in the Central High School zone frightened and terrified a lot of white families whose students would have been attending Central High School in the fall of 1957. And more than 100 students of the possible 200 had expressed interest in attending the school that year. So the new Blossom Plan had several parameters built around it already to exclude as many students as possible. Blossom is on record for saying, I know it is undemocratic and I know it is wrong, but I'm going to implement arbitrary conditions. He would only consider top academic students for admittance into Central. He also did a double interview of students who wanted to attend. And by double interview, I mean that students who were interested in attending Central High School had been interviewed by the principals from Dunbar Junior High and from Horace Mann already. Virgil Blossom insisted on a third interview so that nobody ever forgot that he was the person who was pulling all of the strings for admittance. And he ultimately decided that black students would be excluded from extracurricular activities if they were selected to attend Central High School at all. So their presence in the school would be minimalist. He also forced interviews with mothers and fathers. And this gives us a particularly telling bit of a telling piece of information about intersectionality as it existed in this city. Um, <clears throat> in most families in the 1950s, the father was the breadwinner. And particularly in the South, men tended to have higher paying jobs than women. So it was incumbent upon two parent households that a father always be at work, no matter whether the wife was a stay at home mother or if she had a job or not. The father was generally speaking the breadwinner. 
So this condition of blossoms put black families in a really terrible position of a father having to take off a half day to a full day of labor so that he could go and interview on behalf of his child for a position of Central High School. This was also very uncommon as mothers were the principal guardians and caretakers of children, and that included their education. So essentially what Virgil Blossom was doing with this condition was saying that he would not trust the input of black mothers solely, and particularly the middle class black women that he had already encountered in the court case Aaron versus Cooper. What I argue is that what he really didn't want to do was come up on a whole group of women who were very much like Daisy Bates. <laughs> he, he has a remarkable quote about Daisy Bates in his memoir where he says, quote, she was not a woman about whom others were indifferent, end quote. And that is about the best characterization I've ever heard of this lady, ever. <laughs> um, she refused to be coed by white patriarchy. So did the mothers who wanted their children to integrate Central High School. They were self-assured, they were self-possessed, they were confident, they were middle class, and they demanded to be treated with their respect according to white ladies in the community. <clears throat> Blossom understood this intimately. He spent what I argue is an inordinate subconscious amount of time considering black women. He understood at a subconscious level that whites feared black male sexuality, but he also understood at a subconscious level that black womanhood was made to be the inverse of white womanhood. And the reason that I keep using the word subconscious is because I don't think that Virgil Blossom ever could have broken this conversation down in a sociological way. It was simply the culture in which he lived. But we have 50 years on to look back and see the mechanisms that created it. And so that is the reason that I use the word subconscious in my work. He understood that white, racist, sexist society had characterized, caricatured black womanhood into three forms. Mammy, Jezebel, or Sapphire. He understood that in a white, racist society, the ideal black woman was invisible and that black adolescent girls were not to be treated as emerging young ladies, that they were to be seen as, quote, sexless and overgrown at all times. The NAACP and Blossom worked two sides of the same coin, because of course, middle class black women understood this hierarchy and this construct as well. They specifically sought students who were middle class models of achievement as did Virgil Blossom. Blossom also wanted token students to disappear. But in reality, what he did with his arbitrary conditions was to create an environment where middle class blackness and especially middle class black ladies were highlighted more than they had ever been. This was despite making the interview process for young girls particularly difficult and particularly emotional. He frequently criticized a, quote, lack of emotional responsibility, which in teenage girls is frankly pretty bizarre. You just have to take that with all teenage girls. <laughs> he also frankly admitted that black feminine beauty was distracting to white counterparts. So he is, in effect, tacitly admitted that there were centuries of sexual abuses heaped upon black female bodies. In particular, he noted one student who was interviewed called Miss Poindexter. Miss Poindexter was a model student at Horace Mann High School. She participated in all the right extracurriculars. She was a singer in her church choir. She belonged to a Methodist church in town. She came from a solidly middle-class two-parent home and exhibited all the grace, refinement, and sweetness that a well-brought-up young Southern lady would have. She was perfect. She was the ideal candidate, the all-American girl in every sense of that phrase. The problem was not only her distracting beauty for Virgil Blossom, but that in particular, she was a dark-skinned young black lady. Traditionally, dark skin has been associated with the Jezebel stereotype of black womanhood, and mainstream beauty ideals have prioritized Eurocentric 
white beauty standards juxtaposed specifically to blackness. Black beauty standards in the 1950s also tended to highlight lightness in the community because of perceived advantages for lightness. Daisy Bates in 1976, so several years on from Central High School, actually remembered in an interview to Elizabeth Jackaway, who wrote Turn Away Thy Son, The Crisis of Little Rock High School. She recalled that one of the students who was initially selected to go to Central High School, Carlotta Walls Lanier, was a very light-skinned student, but that she actually caused more questions than she did in visibility because nobody could tell if she was white or black. But in using that excerpt, she underscores the importance of what lightness over darkness meant. Integration ultimately offered the confounding possibility of appealing black womanhood in all of its shades of lightness and darkness, and that this would be placed on an equal level with whiteness, where black girls might be genuinely pursued with the freedom to reject romantic advances, and with the opportunity to be pedestaled for their loveliness, for their tad, and for their grace in the same way that young white ladies were. What Poindexter's rebuke deviates from, however, is that white people's insistence of dark-skinned women as less desirable, less talented, or less worthy of protection was ultimately false. Virgil Blossom, in his denunciation of Miss Poindexter, reveals the intersections of intersectionality. By refusing to admit an eminently qualified dark-skinned girl, he exposed white rage and the prongs that it pivoted on. Dark competed with and sometimes exceeded light on its own presumptions of what constituted feminine worth. And this cast into question the entire concept of juxtaposing whiteness to blackness on its entire Jim Crow foundation. The axis on which Southern social structure pivoted shook to its foundation as black ladies refused the invisibility to white, sexist, racist 